Hello everyone, this is uh, Federica, part of the DocCity team, and it's my pleasure to introduce you to this live presentation of Pekin University School of Transitional Law. Today we will be talking about the legal profession of tomorrow, building a career in emerging superpower. Today with us we have Kola Gar, who is the Director of Graduate and International Programs, and we also have the pleasure to have with us some alumni of the university. I'd like to remind you all that you can write all of your questions into the Q&A box that you find in your Zoom window, and we will be able to answer them during the second part of the presentation. During the presentation, we will also be asking you some questions, so we would like to get to know more about what you probably already informed about the topic. So we would um, like if you could provide us with, with information to make the presentation as interactive as possible. Uh, thank you so much. I think we are ready to start and it's my pleasure to leave the floor to call. Well, good morning, afternoon or evening to everyone, depending on where you are. Um, I'm gonna jump into our topic in, in just a second here, which is talking about kind of the, the legal profession that we see going into the future and, and the way that China really plays a role in that as does our university. But before I actually get to talking about that, um, I wanna kind of further introduce myself. Um, of course, you just heard that my name is Cole Agar and, and my background, my legal, educational and practice background has actually spanned the United States, uh, Egypt, and China. So this idea of an international career and, and looking at the movement of the legal industry is really something that I take quite personally. Um, so I'm very excited to, to tell you about this today. I'm very excited for you all to have an opportunity at the end to hear from, from some of our alumni. And of course, if you have any questions um, we're going to be excited to, to answer those as well. Uh, I'm going to share my screen now, and then we will jump right in. So, first off, um, there, there are really two big trends, two big forces acting on the development of the legal profession today. And the first of those that, that is quite interesting is just this, this growing complexity in the world of law. So what you see first here, this is a, a very famous common law property dispute that is still taught in law school uh, in the United States to this day. This, by comparison, is one of the most famous current property disputes, which is the, the various disputes around the Apple iPhone and its competitors. And in fact, what you are seeing here is only a two-year period from 2010 to 2012, and it's just the patent parts of those property disputes. And, and to some degree, this is representative of this, this first trend affecting the legal industry, which is cases, uh, transactions are becoming increasingly multi-jurisdictional, uh, multilingual. You're having multiple parties from multiple legal backgrounds, uh, multiple types of law involved in a single case or transaction. Um, and, and not only is it becoming more complex, but it is becoming more complex at an accelerating rate. So the degree to which things like technology are now playing a role in law, uh, FinTech, um, all of this is, is really just adding to, um, to, to really the, the complexity and the skills as a result that a lawyer needs today. The second really interesting trend is the way in which we are seeing the World Economic Center moving back towards Asia. And this is at once a, a maybe a, a simpler thing, but also far more profound. So if, if you look at this chart here, what you can see is it took about the first, almost, you know, about 2000 years 
for the economic balance of the world to shift from being around India, Asia towards Europe, right? As we see sort of going into World War uh, II and, and the rise of the United States, um, the, the balance of world economics, right? Business, trade um, had shifted towards Europe. That took, as I said, almost 2000 years. Whereas in just the last 20 years, we've seen the global balance, the economic center of the world shift already almost halfway back towards Asia. And that has been particularly accelerated by the rise of China. Um, and of course, this, this has all kinds of other effects, right? It affects things like uh, where big institutional centers of the future get built, you know, things like the UN. It affects where students go and study. It affects the languages people choose to learn. It affects where banks and finance centers get established in the world. Um, so another really interesting and important trend to the future of the legal industry. And, and what's interesting and how this kind of ties into what I wanna focus on today is there, there's one particular spot on earth right now that can really be seen as sort of a, a center of these two trends that we are seeing. And, and that spot is China's greater Bay Area, um, also sometimes called the Pearl River Delta. Uh, so just to orient you, I'm not actually sure if you guys can see my cursor. If you can't, it's fine. Um, but the area that we're talking about is this, this area in southern China, um, most famous for Hong Kong. But it's actually an area that has come to encompass this whole area around Hong Kong. Um, and, and right now, it is actually the, the largest metropolitan area on Earth. So this whole area has become connected by, you know, high speed rail, buses, um, you know, I mean, it, it essentially functions as one continuous city, the largest city in the history of our planet. And by some estimates, in the next, uh, in the next few years, it could reach a population of something in the realm of 100 million people. And, and although I mentioned that Hong Kong is the most famous city in this region, in many ways, it's actually been another city that has been the, the kind of hub of a lot of this recent development in this part of China. And that city is Shenzhen. So the, the picture that you're seeing in front of you right now is Shenzhen in 1979. And I just want you to keep your eyes uh, kind of focused on that mountain range in the background as I tell you that this is Shenzhen today. And essentially the only thing that has remained the same is that mountain line in the background. Uh, so actually at this point, I wanna, I wanna throw up the first polling question, uh, like a little quiz question. So Federica, if, uh, if you're able to put it up from your end. Yeah, so it's now going live. We're asking what important events happened in China in 1980. You do have uh, three options that you can choose from. And uh, let's all answer. And I will be sharing the results in a few seconds. You can see more people are voting. And so as you saw, that first picture was 1979. So in a sense, what I'm asking you is what event happened a, a year after that sort of marshy forest land that you saw in the first picture? Okay, so let's see what so far we answered. Okay, so you should be able to see the results, Cole. Yes, I can. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I, I like the way you're all thinking. I think it shows that if nothing else, some of you are, are following the presentation and, and hopefully at least reading the, the titles at the bottoms. And, and, and you're right. I mean, for the 
50% of you or so uh, who, who answered uh, correctly. Um, Federica, do you mind? You can put down yeah, the poll now. Yeah, of course. Um, so the thing that happened in 1980 is China declared Shenzhen its first special economic zone. And this was really part of a, a broader, important moment in China, which was the beginning of China starting to open up to the rest of the world. So from this opening up, from this designation of Shenzhen as the first special economic zone, came China's first experimentation with kind of modern laws, with uh, contract law, with uh, little bits of like corporate law. Um, and this was happening in Shenzhen kind of a, a, a good few years before it started spreading to other parts of China. And the result is that, you know, since then, in, in basically one generation, Shenzhen has gone from being essentially a, an agricultural fishing center um, to being one of the fastest growing, most successful cities in the world. And we've seen it go through this period of first being kind of a manufacturing hub and now really being known as one of the most important tech hubs, technology centers in the world. Um, it's, it's often referred to now as the Silicon Valley of China. It's become a, a big center also for finance. It has had uh, the fastest GDP growth rate of any city in China, which just to put this in perspective, when President Trump first ran uh, for president in the US, he kind of, he boasted that he would get the US GDP growth rate to 4%. And people were actually kind of impressed when he got it to uh, about 3.8%. So Shenzhen has been more than quintupling that for about a decade. Um, it's, it's also become the highest uh, center for patents in the country. And we're gonna get to that in a second um, because, because related to this kind of the fact that it's become this very important technology hub, um, it has also come to attract some of the most important companies in China. So Federica, do you mind throwing up the, uh, the second poll question? Of course. So basically we're asking you, where do you think Asia's most valuable company is located. We have three options. We have Tokyo, Japan, Shenzhen, China, and Seoul in South Korea. I can see that some of you are already answering. Let's leave a few more seconds and I'll be able to share the results. Perfect. So let's see, Cole, let me share results with you. All right. Um, I see that everyone is still paying attention, or at least most of you. That's good to see. Um, yeah, so about almost uh, three quarters of you answered Shenzhen, China. Um, Federica, can you close out? So. I mentioned how the, the, this development in Shenzhen has led to some of these very important companies being based there and particularly tech companies. So one of the first ones I'll mention quick is Tencent, which is sometimes seen as kind of like a, a Google of China. Um, today, it is the world's most uh, uh, largest investment corporation. It's the largest video game company in the world. It actually beat out Facebook a couple of years ago as the largest social media company in the world. And by some valuations, it is the most valuable company in all of Asia. I should add as an asterisk, uh, since the pandemic, some now have Alibaba, which is another Chinese company as the most valuable uh, company in Asia, but they're basically neck and neck. Um, Another company that tends to need much less introduction is Huawei, 
which today is the largest telecommunications manufacturer in the world, and of course has become very well known um, for its smartphones. Um, but it's other areas of kind of innovation as well. So we have like BGI, which is a, a big genome center based in Shenzhen, um, DGI drones, um, which is actually a company, I'll, I'll, I'll pause here for a second, just because I think it's, it's an interesting example of some of the types of new development coming out of Shenzhen. So I told you, for example, a, a second ago that Tencent is, is often seen as like uh, the Google of China. And you'll still find a lot of companies in China compared to their Western counterpart. Um, right, I mean, Huawei will get compared to Apple or to Samsung, for example. What's interesting about DGI is they are actually the, the leader in the field of drones. Um, and it, it is actually other companies around the world that tend to be copying them or compared to them. In fact, a lot of people don't even know that DGI is a Chinese company. Um, another interesting one, uh, BYD, Build Your Dreams. Um, this is one of the fastest growing automotive companies in the world and a leader in electric uh, automotive technology. And, and so one result of this, right, all these new businesses, new tech, is the effect that that has had on, on one of the most interesting areas of law today, which is intellectual property law, and, and especially patents, um, right, the, the sort of the legal concept that you can own an idea, that you can own a technology. And what you can see from, from the graph here is that China has skyrocketed in the last uh, decade or so. And actually this data is a, a bit out of date. It shows China about to surpass Japan. Actually that has long since happened. And in the last few years, China is now basically neck and neck with the United States in terms of the amount of new technology, new patents being filed coming out of China. And what's particularly interesting about that is that from all of China, if you look on the little bar graph here on the side, what you will notice is that almost half of all those new patents being developed in China come out of just one city and that city is Shenzhen. Um, it's, it's not just uh, the world of tech. Um, this area has also become a, a very important financial center. Um, so this, for example, is the Qianhai Business Center. Uh, it's a multi-trillion dollar financial services sector that actually spans um, uh, Shenzhen and Hong Kong. Um, I had a polling question for you here, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip that, the, my third polling question. And in just a moment here, I'm gonna go straight to the, um, to the fourth one, actually. Um, so Federica, do you mind putting up the of question course. about the legal background, the Absolutely. difference between Shenzhen and Hong Kong? So in here, we're asking you, what is the legal background of Hong Kong and mainland China? You do have three options, and then we will look at the results together with Cole. Give you time to answer. It's very interesting. It's a, it's a good way of learning and guessing to answer these questions. Perfect. We'll just leave it a few seconds for all of you to take a guess. And let me share the results with you, Paul. There you are. All right, very interesting. Um, I, I think this was the, is the hardest question I have and, and in some ways is also the most interesting, which is why I really wanted to, to pause on this here. So I see that it was pretty split, but almost 40% of you picked up correctly or, or knew correctly 
that the background of mainland China is civil law, right? It's, it's kind of a, a German hybrid bringing in other, other elements of different legal backgrounds. But mainland China is essentially civil law. Whereas Hong Kong, the old, proud British common law tradition. Uh, Federica, do you mind closing out of the poll question of here? Of course. So, so why that's interesting is this financial services center being built, which when it is completed, it's actually predicted that it will become the third largest financial hub in the world uh, after uh, New York and London. But what's particularly unique about it is that it actually spans civil law China, mainland China, and common law Hong Kong. Both of those jurisdictions contained within this one financial services center. And if you can remember kind of back to this, this trend that I was mentioning at the beginning of the, the growing complexities happening in the world of law today, and the fact that more and more, you know, business transactions happen across different legal jurisdictions. Well, this is almost, it's, it's like that phenomenon on steroids, right? I mean, here is one, you know, almost like one city, one metropolitan area in the world that actually spans two different legal systems. So the types of, of challenges, right? The types of legal and business complexities that are happening more and more around the world are happening on an incredibly accelerated rate in this area, right? In China's greater Bay Area. And I'll come back to, to part of this uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, another kind of interesting similar sort of development that we've seen is the merger of the Shenzhen and Hong Kong stock exchanges. Um, again, something that creates a lot of interesting complexity. Um, this area, China's Greater Bay Area, is also one of the most important hubs in the world for international trade. Um, it's actually the largest hub in China for international trade. And China itself has really become kind of the, the business trading partner of the world today, with Shenzhen specifically having the highest foreign export volume. And as I mentioned, being this world hub for, for tech innovation and manufacturing. Um, there's, there's another final thing that I'll mention here kind of quickly, although it really could almost deserve an entire presentation by itself. So I mentioned that, you know, a, a lot of these changes, a lot of these sort of special developments that Shenzhen and the Greater Bay Area have gone through can maybe be traced back to this period of Shenzhen opening up to the world as China's first special economic zone. And we've seen kind of a, an echo of that initial policy um, just recently in 2019. So in 2019, China actually declared uh, this initiative, the Shenzhen Model City Initiative. Um, and while we don't entirely know what will happen with this yet, it's still too new, from what, uh, what China published about it, one of the things that's interesting is that in addition to kind of new rules, regulations, incentives, promoting things like, uh, you know, tech innovation, commercial law, which is how Shenzhen sort of first innovated as being a center in, in China. Now, one of the things that they are looking to Shenzhen is as a possible kind of area to experiment within China with things like increased rule of democracy and rule of law. Again, we, we don't actually know kind of exactly what form this will take, but it's another interesting example of China seeing Shenzhen as this area to kind of experiment with new ideas and new developments that again, make for a, a kind of increasingly complex legal world taking place in this part of China. So a big question then comes out uh, of all of this, right? All this, this new development, these new uh, uh, kind of technologies, these, these complexities 
in the law that are happening in this part of China is kind of what, like, how are those handled, right? What are the institutions that can actually deal with these sorts of new complexities, right? What are the new ideas that need to be experimented with? And, and one interesting example is, so, so for, for a second, put your mind back to when I was telling you about the Qianhai Business Center, right? This big financial center spanning civil law, mainland Shenzhen, and common law, Hong Kong. So one of the things that, that Shenzhen has experimented with to, um, to try to handle some of these disputes arising in this area is kind of hybrid court systems. So one example of that is experimenting with courts in Qianhai that actually blend a mainland Chinese uh, civil law court with a Hong Kong jury which is really interesting. I mean, it, it can sound a bit, I don't know, like just words, but if you think of something like, you know, let's say the United States told France, uh, you know, we do a lot of business with you, uh, you know, French court, we think you should use a jury from the United States. I mean, the, the French judge would laugh you out of the courtroom like it was some sort of legal science fiction. Um, and yet, this is actually an idea being experimented with in Shenzhen. Um, another example of, of kind of a, a new and successful type of experimental court that has been used in Shenzhen are specialized intellectual property courts. Um, and, and of course, you know, we talked about how uh, China in general, but especially this area of Shenzhen and the Greater Bay Area has become one of the biggest tech centers, one of the biggest intellectual property centers in the world. And so one way that China has been um, kind of working to improve how it handles those complex technology cases is by actually creating courts where what they specifically focus on are these complex intellectual property cases. And, and one of the most prominent of those is based in Shenzhen. Um, there's also been some experimentation with passing like a new intellectual property law specifically for Shenzhen. We've also seen things like the, the merger of two uh, international arbitration centers in Shenzhen. So creating some new forums to resolve some of these uh, different kind of complex international disputes. Um, another interesting development based in Shenzhen is Benchmark Chambers International. So this is China's first legal think tank based in Shenzhen. And, and the idea of it is that it, well, I should say one of the things that it's doing, one of the, the projects that it works on is looking at foreign laws and trying to identify foreign laws that China might be able to benefit from or aspects of foreign law that China might be able to incorporate into its own legal developments. Um, so one kind of interesting thing that, that um, that maybe you can see in, in China's legal system is they're, they're fairly pragmatic in a lot of areas. I mean, especially in kind of commercial business, these types of laws. Um, China is not particularly idealistic, right? Like France or the United States. They're willing to look at a law from the US or look at a, a model law from the UN and say, yeah, that could work for us. You know, let's give it a try. And, and this think tank in Shenzhen is one of the entities that is, that's doing that sort of work and the first of its kind in China. And, and so then the kind of the final way that I'll talk about kind of how, um, how China has been experimenting with some of these, these new developments and innovations to handle the growing complexity and the growing internationalization of the legal world is the School of Transnational Law. Um, that's the school where I'm from. Uh, it's a school where you're gonna, you're gonna hear from some uh, alumni in just a moment. 
And, and in many ways, sort of the, the reason that the School of Transnational Law at Peking University exists is because of this story of Shenzhen and the greater Bay Area that we've been talking about. Um, so first, if you're not already familiar with Peking University, uh, you should be. It's the oldest university in China, uh, and it is one of the most prestigious universities in the world. While it is not as well known uh, in the West as it is in, you know, in Asia, for example, it actually ranks similarly to Western universities like NYU. Um, and so what you have, right, kind of the origins of the School of Transnational Law is you have this old historic, um, you know, kind of prestigious Harvard of China University partnering with this, this kind of this new developing city of Shenzhen. And one of the schools that they created to, to kind of bring those two forces together was the School of Transnational Law. So it was created in China as the first uh, Juris Doctorate, like uh, US style Juris Doctorate degree program um, taught completely in English. Uh, the first and, and to this day, the only of its kind in China. It's the only school in the world that combines a, uh, a common law Juris Doctorate degree with a Chinese Juris Master's degree. So all of our Chinese students graduate having done a full common law uh, uh, curriculum, just like you would if you went to the United States alongside a full Chinese law curriculum. And it also created an LLM program in the same spirit that combines Western law, Eastern law, you know, Chinese law, international law with a very high focus on building kind of the, the actual legal practice skills that are becoming more and more important today. Um, so there's a, there's a high focus on the school on, on you know, both this idea of um, kind of international or transnational law, right? The types of law that spans multiple countries, um, as well as kind of the, the other side of what a modern career in law needs, which is a higher focus on the kind of the actual practical pragmatic skills and knowledge that a lawyer needs, right? When you're not practicing in, in one country, maybe knowing the kind of the, the legal doctrine of one country becomes a lot less useful. Whereas knowing the types of professional skills that a lawyer needs serves you in potentially any of those countries that you might end up practicing. So you would find within our courses, um, you know, courses that emphasize more applied knowledge, practical knowledge, so things like capital market transactions with Hong Kong or foreign direct investment in China. You also find a lot of skills building classes. So things like bilingual contract drafting or cross-cultural negotiations. And, and then you find a, a teaching style um, largely modeled off of kind of what we see is, is kind of the US style of legal education although something that's growing in popularity in the world. Um, and that is really a focus on more interactive classes, kind of discussion-based classes that, are, that have more give and take with the professor, um, smaller classes, higher use of elective classes. So students can really pick the different courses that they want to focus on within their studies. And to make that work, um, we bring together a, a very international faculty. About a third of our faculty are Chinese, about a third are American or American trained, and about a third are kind of generally international from other areas like Australia, you know, South Korea, Europe, etc. Um, and, and the other result of that is that, you know, within our um, within our LLM program, 
we have been able to attract students from around the world. I mean, literally from every continent other than Antarctica. And if anyone knows of a law school in Antarctica, uh, we are happy to recruit a student from there as well. Um, but there's really been no sort of regional focus to where our LLM students come from. And, and one of the things that I think is really most important to our LLM students, our international students who come and study in the program, is that the, the Chinese students that you are studying alongside are the students who have been dreaming from the time they were kids and working like crazy throughout their education to be in a university like Peking University. So you're studying alongside some of the top law students in the country. Law students that will go on to be partners at law firms, international law firms, Chinese law firms, in-house counsel at some of the biggest businesses in the world, um, you know, government officials in China. And unlike many LLM programs where international students are kind of put in a, a pod of, you know, special classes in English just for those international students, we don't do that. Because we were built from the ground up with a full English language curriculum, essentially any class that our international students take, you are studying side by side with these Chinese students, these leaders of the Chinese legal uh, market, you know, in the future. And, and in many ways, kind of going back to this, this theme of the, the skills, the, the legal um, kind of industry of tomorrow, this idea of, of really getting to know your Chinese colleagues studying alongside them is maybe one of the most important takeaways from the program. Because so much of what you will find you end up meeting in an international practice is cultural understanding. It is your, your network of connections in other countries. Um, and, and this can really be one of the most valuable things that you take away from uh, an international degree like an LLM. Um, and you know, again, more and more so, where the value of those connections is shifting to in the world is China. Um, so I, I'm excited now to switch to, to you guys actually getting to hear from some of our alumni. Um, I have up here just quickly, these are some of the places that uh, recent LLM students have either worked or interned either in China or related to, uh, to Chinese practice. Um, and you'll get to hear a little bit more about uh, some of these opportunities and experiences from uh, some of our alumni who are gonna be speaking with you now. So I'm going to I'm going to exit full screen here. Um, but first, I'm just going to introduce our, our first alumni speaker, um, Nicholas, who is is actually a, a lawyer working out of Hong Kong currently. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Nicholas to tell you a bit about his experience at the School of Transnational Law and his experience uh, working in China and anything else he might want you to know. Uh, thank you, Cole. Uh, my, uh, my name is Nicholas. I'll be very, very brief for the interest of time. Uh, largely, I'm going to talk about why I chose to join STL and how that decision has influenced my career so far. So joining STL, my decision to join was based on three factors. One, being from Uganda, Africa. China is Africa's largest trading partner since 2009. Now, with the Belt and Road Initiative, it became clear that China would become an indispensable economic partner. As a practicing lawyer, you're looking for business, you're looking for clients. 
if the market is being dominated by Chinese, you have to come on board and understand what drives them, the kind of business they're into. So that's what, that was one of the reasons. And STL offered me this platform to understand the Chinese culture to, and, and, and to be able to get into that area of practice. The second reason it perhaps is the fact that I was able to get uh, a joint scholarship for my wife and I. This being a graduate school, it offered a unique opportunity to have where you find a husband and wife there in the same institution. And that helped me deal with, the, with separation anxiety and the idea that you can be in the same university without, without breaking up. So it was unique in a way, and we opted for it. We had uh, very good scholarship opportunities from the Chinese Scholarship Council, from STL, from the, uh, the business school. And uh, the third reason is uh, Peking being a top ranking university. It's, uh, it was a fantastic opportunity and I'm now feeling it in practice. Whenever I have a conversation with, with Chinese, like, oh, you went to Beida. They, they cannot believe it. Like, wow, that's so cool. That's so good. You went to Peking, yeah. So th there is a certain kind of respect they give you. So, and that comes with the reputation. Now, fast forward. How has this decision influenced uh, my career so far? I would, I would say that joining STL was or is a career defining moment for my life. Um, before, before coming to STL, I was doing litigation, court related, uh, court related matters. But when I joined STL, the kind of classes I was exposed to, it transformed me from a litigation lawyer to a cross-border practice type of person. And uh, most of these classes, especially I'll, I'll talk about, I'll talk about uh, a few classes such as international business transactions that member taught by um, a certain professor. Um, I'll talk about the most important actually could have been the cross-cultural cross -culture negotiations where it gave us the techniques to deal with different cultures and have the understanding of it. Then I can also fail, I cannot fail to mention uh, international arbitration, international commercial arbitration, treaty arbitration. Now, this gave me the understanding of cross-border practice they equipped me with a certain background or training when I applied to join these international law firms, it, it came in handy. But besides applying for a job and getting a job, there is another opportunity that came up. And perhaps this might interest those who are interested in coming to China. China dominates the world when it comes to manufacturing. And I bring this up as this, is a side business that actually started uh, about a year ago. And within a space of one year, we've, we've been able to handle business of over 50 million US dollars as a side business. Basically what it does, we, we, we help in trade sourcing, we help in doing background checks and factories, we help in drafting agreements, this uh, supply agreements, we help in doing inspections, now, for someone interested in, in making money, besides from, from office, it's, and anyone international coming in from different countries, it's, it's a unique opportunity because there is a certain space that needs to be filled. If you have a student, say, from, say from Colombia, you may have people who import stuff from Colombia, sorry, from China to Colombia, but they may not be able to travel to China all the time. And they may not have the understanding of the Chinese culture. But you, with your connections in China, with the understanding of the Chinese culture and how things are done, you're in a unique position. Just use your connections and make money. So it's, it's, it's something that's, that if you're in China, you have to take advantage of. Besides working in a top law firm or besides working with a top organization, but other business opportunities that are available. So 
my time in China or my decision to join STO is a decision that has become lucrative at the end, at the end of the two years. And for anyone looking to further the education, for anyone looking to, to grow their practice, I would say that the future is in the East. And uh, I'll be able to welcome, maybe if there are certain questions that people have some queries, I'll be in the interest of time. I'd like to stop here and let my other colleagues share uh, their time and stories in China and STL. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicholas. Um, next, I'm gonna I'm gonna hand the mic off to another one of our alumni, uh, Julia. Hello, uh, everyone. Yes, my name is Julia. So um, yes, so like as to the reasons why why did I choose to go to STL? I think for me it was um, like I was looking for a program where I was able to to deep to deepen my knowledge in international slash transnational law. And when I looked at the program of STL, I saw that they have like a big variety of different classes, like in international private law, they have international public law, they have arbitration, like um, Nicolas mentioned, they have um, negotiation classes, very practical, like drafting classes. And all those classes, um, they are taught by very renowned uh, professors from common law states like the US, like the UK. We had the teacher from uh, Australia. Um, and this was also like, for me, it was personally, it was an indication of quality. And then like um, my second reason was more like um, of personal uh, nature. I was looking for an adventure. Um, I wanted to go to a country where um, like where you have a completely different culture. And I think like um, for me, like China, the, the thought that I could go to China um, living in a culture where like which is completely different from Western culture, like live in a hyper modern city like Shenzhen, which is like the city itself is younger than I am. So this was like really something I was interested in. So like, how was it? Like, what was my experience then? Um, like for me, it was really a big adventure. It was obviously completely different from what I knew, knew uh, what I knew from home, Switzerland. Like I grew up in, like in a small medieval town, and then I lived for like almost like one and a half year in in cities like uh, Shenzhen and Shanghai. Um, it was also like sometimes like hard. Um, for example, like in the city, you can speak in English, that's no problem. But when you go outside of the cities, uh, no one speaks English. But um, like the positive aspect there was really like the people, like the people in China, maybe like in other countries, but they were so like helpful, they were interested. Um, they, were, they were caring. I never felt alone. Also, like people at STL, uh, other students or staff, they were always there if you had a problem. Um, and yeah, it, it like, like also the, the time studying at STL, like it was not also only with other internationals. Um, a lot of the students were Chinese and this was also part of the cultural experience because even though like Cole said, they, they, they worked hard, like crazy hard. They studied uh, much more than I did, but they always had time like for a coffee. They were interested. They showed me places. Um, so that was really a positive experience. Um, and then also like um, when when I end my classes after three quarters, I decided to do an internship at uh, Bonnard and Lawson. Um, this is like a law firm which is linked to somehow to Switzerland. So for me, it was important to do this internship just to see, um, yeah, how is it as, a, as an international lawyer in China? Can you work there? Is it even possible? Because I don't speak Chinese and I, I couldn't imagine how you can work there. So this was really interesting because 
um, in this law firm, you had like two partners from Israel and from Portugal, and the rest of the lawyers were from China. And just to see how they work together, and yeah, the, the work mentality and everything was very interesting. So it was re really um, uh, a great experience. And now, like, just like I want to keep it very short. So what was the what is the benefit of this whole program of this LLM degree? Um, because as you saw, I, I don't work at the China desk now. I work um, like for the government. But I think what Cole said, um, when you have an LLM degree from from chat like from STL, um, it also shows that you are open minded that you are used to find yourself like to, to, to work in an international environment. Um, I also like, it's great to have the, like a network. Um, like I know so many people from all over the world, like from India, from South America, from Africa, um, which uh, like studied with me or worked with me in China. So I'm still in touch with those people and um, Yes, yeah, so all in all, I um, I think it was one of the greatest things I did so far. So yeah, <laughs> I think that's it. Uh, thank you, Julia. Um, and last but not least, I will I'll hand the floor to Marius. Thanks, Cole. Uh, so hello everyone. I'm Marius. I'm also from Switzerland. I graduated uh, from PKUSTL last summer. So Julia and I actually graduated from the same class, whereas Nick, I think he graduated probably maybe a term or, or a year earlier. And for me, I think the, the basic reason at the beginning why I started looking into programs in, in China and, and STL was that I was mainly looking for, for an adventure, I think. I wasn't really like thinking of business opportunities, but I wanted to do something just completely different. Um, I think many lawyers in, in Switzerland and in Europe in general, um, for the LLMs, the kind of the tradition has always been to look, to look westwards, mainly the US. So in the law firm where I work right now, I think most of our lawyers have LLM degrees from, from American universities or from the UK. And I thought I wanted to kind of have a different profile, uh, be a little bit special, you know, uh, with a different than other people. So that was kind of the beginning, starting considering going, going to China. Um, I looked at different programs within China, and what I liked about the the, the offer of, of STL or the program is that it's a, it's a pretty broad range of of subjects, of topics, of classes you can do. Uh, there's not a focus on on just let's say arbitration or some corporate areas of the law. So it would allow me to kind of, you know, pick what I'm interested in and, and kind of make my own program. Um, so that was that was a big reason. And then and then the location. I mean, we've heard it in, in Cole's presentation. Um, Shenzhen itself is, is just this crazy town that went from a small fishing village to what it is today in just a couple of years. Uh, we like the kind of the group that I would do travels with during the, the program. We went to Taiwan, we were in Hong Kong many times, we went to Macau, so it's really it's a huge opportunity just also to kind of explore this area where maybe you wouldn't go that easily. If you deal with China, at some point in time you will end up in Shanghai and Beijing and, and whatnot, but kind of to, to have this connection with the southern area, I think that was, that was also a huge, a huge plus for me. And um, then actually doing the program, being at STL, I would say in hindsight there are, there are kind of three types of, of classes uh, that, that we did there. There's kind of one type is where you would get a, let's say deeper understanding of, of kind of, you know, China's background, history, legal history. I remember the uh, class being on the subject of traditional Chinese legal thought, where we would be introduced to, you know, theories of, of Confucius, Mensch, Sinze, Lao Tzu, um, which, is, which is amazing just to have this, this chance, you know, to, to kind of engage in, into these things. Um, then I would say kind of a second category were classes that I need now in, in my work that are practical, you know, focused on, on legal jobs of lawyers working today related to China. So we also heard it in Cole's presentation, the, there's for example the, the class on foreign direct investment in China, which I use now all the time where you learn if you advise a foreign company, 
uh, about investment in China, what are kind of the restrictions, how is China organized, what kind of economical vehicles, you know, are at your availability to operate within China. Um, we had an overview of the Chinese judicial system, with kind of comparisons of, you know, what is, what is different, what is similar to how our understanding of, of a legal system, separation of powers, these, these kind of issues. And then the third category, I would say, are, are a kind of normal classes in the sense that you could do these classes uh, anywhere, basically, like uh, contract negotiations, um, let's say contract, contract drafting classes. But of course, you have to prove that you share all these classes with your Chinese classmates. So you would get from these, I don't know, you would always get into these topics, uh, how to negotiate, how aggressive your style should be. And suddenly you realize that other people from other places have completely different ideas on these issues. So. So that was great. So I think that's kind of the three, the three areas. And that was exactly what I was looking for to kind of have access to all these different kinds of, kinds of classes. And the overall experience of, of living and studying in, in China, I mean, it's, it's just a huge adventure. Um, personally, I really enjoyed being somewhere where you don't have everyone speaking English and you kind of just, just to survive, you need to, I don't know, use any kind of skills you have. And, and the, I mean, the English thing, you will, you will realize that the first time you at STL, there are a lot of different canteens. The first time you enter a canteen and you want to order some food and try to explain to the, the chef or the cook either the food you want or the specific food you do not want, you see kind of the, the barriers that are there and then kind of the, the means that you have to kind of cross these barriers. So it's a, it's a huge adventure. And I think personally, the, probably the biggest highlight just from the overall experience uh, was that because you, you're not a tourist, um, so you're there for some time, you have time to, to meet people, your classmates, Chinese classmates, and, and build friendships. And then once you have kind of the, um, kind of a, you know, you talk amongst friends, you can discuss all these things. I mean, at the end of the day, it's, to me, it's amazing. We're people, we do the same thing. We're studying law. We're trying to, you know, make the best out of our opportunities, preparing ourselves for a, for a legal career. And then just sharing our kind of you know worries and passions and plans for the future and, and having you know discussions on, on history and politics and kind of moral issues and, and whatnot. So I think those are really that's that's I think that's the number one thing that I got out of the experience. And that continues up to today. I'm also still in touch with, with uh, many different people. For me personally, these connections mostly originated from language exchanges. Um, I mean the program is pretty dense, but of course. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a perfect opportunity to, to work on your Chinese skills, uh, which is very hard, I would say. So uh, you need some perseverance there. But there's a lot of uh, Chinese students there that are interested in English, but also other languages that they maybe have spent some time abroad. And so these kind of languages exchanges, in all cases, uh, for me personally, they turn into really good friendships and then went from just language exchanges to exchanges on, on any topic, uh, whatever. So. So that was that was uh, that was really great. Then, um, as Julia, I also I also had uh, went to Beijing after finishing all my classes and, and handing in the master's thesis in Shenzhen. I worked in a Swiss law firm called Wenfei Law, um, who is a, rep a representative office of, of a Swiss firm based in Zurich. I worked there for half a year, and I think for the perfect experience that should kind of be part of it, kind of using the skills that you learned and, you know, using those in, in the daily working life of a lawyer. What we would mainly do there were um, arbitration cases involving Chinese parties, um, advising foreign companies, private individuals about investing in China, where I could use, you know, what I learned in the foreign direct investment class with uh, Professor Thomas Mann. So there was, a, there was a, a, a huge link between what I learned at NSTL and what I could use. Uh, I also I lived with a Chinese host family during my time in Beijing. Um, maybe not for everybody, but for me personally, that was also kind of a, a nice experience. I didn't speak any English. It was a hardcore Beijing accent, uh, so a lot of communication issues. But you know, people with huge hearts, and uh, it was also a fantastic experience. Um, now, where has where has the experience at STL led me? I'm now back in Switzerland. Um, I work. I work at a law firm called Altenburger. Uh, we have a China desk, or Altenburger had already a China desk, uh, focusing mainly on, on arbitration as well, commercial arbitration involving Chinese parties. 
uh, advising Swiss and European companies uh, for investing in, in China, establishing distribution networks, providing agents, uh, setting up manufacturing plants, etc. Uh, we also advise Chinese entities that want to acquire or merge with uh, Swiss or European companies. So my work is very China related. Um, I actually got in touch with this firm while I was studying at STL, while I was in, in Shenzhen. And when I came back to Switzerland, I immediately started work here. So uh, for me as well, the whole experience, the decision going to STL hugely influenced to where I am now and how I'm kind of planning to where to lay the focus of my, of my professional, professional life. Um, so maybe as a finishing note, I think there's definitely challenges. I think there were challenges every day. Um, China is a very different environment on, on many different levels. But I think if you kind of know that, anticipate that, and you're kind of looking forward from a really from a different for a different environment, I think uh, you will have the same extraordinary, fantastic experience that I had that I have here. That's it for me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Marius and Cole, Julia, and Nicholas for your for sharing your experience with us. And I think it's now time to answer the question. I can see why we were presenting. There were some questions uh, coming into the Q and A, and we actually invite you all to write all of your questions. And as we shared in the chat, uh, we do have shared with you Cole's email address, and we'll also be sending you an email after this webinar, so you can actually get in contact with Cole directly. So one of the first questions we had from Karim was, how does someone qualify to practice law in China coming from a common law background? Do I have to go through a law school? Yeah, so I can I can start off on this question. And I noticed a, a couple other people um, who, who wrote in questions through the Q&A had similar sort of questions. So I'll answer the specific question, but also speak a little bit more broadly uh, to the topic. Um, and I might, if, uh, if Nicholas is, uh, is willing, pull him in at some point on this, on this as well. Um, so the, the first thing that I would say, uh, just to put it simply, is that um, unlike some countries, like the US, for example, a, a foreign lawyer does not become bar certified in China, um, but you don't necessarily need to be bar certified in China to do many aspects of a legal career. Um, so, you know, unlike the US where you cannot do anything in the United States related to law without having passed the bar in the state where you're practicing, in a country like China, um, you know, the, the main thing you need the bar for is going into court representing a client. But most lawyers today do not actually spend much of their practice in court representing clients. So you can work in areas like arbitration, transactional law, you know, doing things like uh, corporate and commercial law. Um, working as like in-house counsel at a company. Those are all things that you can do as a foreign lawyer um, in China, and you don't necessarily need to be bar certified. Um, in terms of kind of, do you need an LLM then? Well, you don't need an LLM to get bar certified. In fact, an LLM will not help you to get bar certified in China. The way that an LLM helps you get a job in China is, is more the fact that China can simply be a, a very difficult legal market to break into from the outside. We see more and more foreign lawyers um, starting to work in China. Actually, there was an interesting paper published a couple of years ago um, about the fact that actually the biggest movement of upper lawyers, you know, partners, for example, at law firms, used to always be between US firms and UK firms. Now it's actually between Western firms and Chinese firms. So we are seeing more and more foreign lawyers kind of at, at all levels um, working in China, but it can be hard to get into that market 
if you don't have your foot in the door. And doing something like an LLM in China can be one of your best ways to get your foot in the door to starting a job in China. And it may be like, as you, as you heard from some of our alumni, that you don't, you may, you may not settle in China long term, but even the value of something like spending a few months working in China and getting that on the ground work experience can be one of you know perhaps the the most worthwhile things that you end up bringing back to your home country or to you know working at some international institution that wants someone with those types of um, Chinese expertise. The the thing I was going to ask maybe Nicholas uh, if he doesn't mind um, speaking for a second here is if, um, you know of of the three alumni we have uh, with us today. Um, Nicholas has actually been doing work, um, you know, continuously uh, based in China. Um, so I, I'd be curious, kind of, Nicholas, your perspective on kind of maybe maybe if there were extra barriers you you wouldn't have thought about um, to moving uh, to to a job working based out of China. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, thanks, Cole. Um, I agree with your with your submission, your assessment uh, that Karim asked. Uh, you, you cannot take the Chinese bar unless you're Chinese. Now, by that very fact, that means that you can, you, you will not be eligible to practice uh, like Chinese law or to be bar certified, like you said, in China. But it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop you from doing work. This is my personal experience. The, you're able to do to practice law in China in different scenarios. One, if you're with an international law firm and most of your work is cross-border, like my experience, you find most of the work you do is, is, is outbound work, going to Africa, going to Europe. It's, you can do that work. Another scenario where you can maybe like practice law in China is that's when you're given the title of consultant. Uh, you can work as a consultant in a Chinese law firm, but of course you have to be under a Chinese certified lawyer, bar certified lawyer. Um, the the other the other inroad you can take is, and this happened to me, you can be named a director in some of these companies that uh, it's a, um, a director and through that you have a way to work not only as, as a consultant, but also the ability to say practice, uh, practice law in China. But if you want to do the bar, you have to be Chinese to sit the bar course. But it doesn't stop you from practicing law in China or doing legal work, especially where you most of your work is is cross border, cross border and arbitration. And so it's like Karim asked, the first place to be is are you able to get into China? Can you get an LLM? If you do, it opens doors because most of these schools have opportunities for internships. But it's very, very unlikely that you're going to get internship if you're based outside China. So you have to come in, you have to be on the ground, and then that's when the opportunities arise. Because there is an insatiable market for foreign lawyers, especially lawyers who are from the common law jurisdiction. I'm from a common law jurisdiction. There is an insatiable market. If you're, if you're qualified in your, in your, in your jurisdiction, if you're, you have certain skills, you have, you not being Chinese or not having Chinese bar will not stop you from being able to work as a lawyer in China. Thank you so much, Nicholas, and thank you, Cole. I can see we have more questions coming. One is from Ilaria. She say, hi, I'm from Ilaria from Italy. Uh, I would like to ask if there are any requirements in order to uh, apply to Peking University, for example, 
age limit, increased proficiency, or any other sort of requirements? Sure, that's something I can definitely talk about. Um, so, uh, Ilaria, the first thing I would say is the kind of the application process is pretty similar, I think, to what you would find in a lot of LLM programs. You know, you need uh, a previous degree, your transcripts, kind of an, an essay talking about why you want to go to our program, um, some letters of recommendation, and all of that is, is stuff that, you know, it usually is not too, too difficult for most of our students. Um, I, I do see that you ask about English language proficiency. Um, so that is a requirement. Um, the kind of the, if you're familiar with the, the TOEFL or the IELTS, our TOEFL minimum score is a 92. Um, our IELTS score is a 6.5 you can be exempt from needing to take either of those if either you're a native speaker of English or if you have previously completed a program in English. So if you did you know, an LLB in English, if you maybe already did a, a master's degree somewhere like the UK, um, then you would not need to take the, the TOEFL or the IELTS. Otherwise, we, we definitely have no age requirement. We have had you know, 22 year olds get accepted to our program. And we have had, you know, mid 50 year olds who are looking at doing a change in their career uh, come into our program. The average age is probably like late twenties, kind of around in there, maybe 25 to 33 would be my estimate of the average age. Um, the, the final thing I would add about kind of being admitted to the school is our application deadline is coming up in one month. So it is, it is the end of March. If anyone hearing about our program today or intrigued by the idea of studying in China uh, feels that spark of motivation to, to get right on the application process, please uh, write to me right away. You have plenty of time still to apply and we will work with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, to answer any questions you have, to help with any issues you have. Um, I think any of our alumni on this call today would, would agree with me when I say we're very helpful, we're very communicative. Um, anything you need, we, we really do our best to, to help our international students. Thank you so much, Cole. Um, another question they're asking us, which uh, specializations are offered within the program? Sure, so that's, uh, that's a, an interesting question. Um, so the first thing I would say is, is actually going back to something that Maria said, which is we don't put students on a specific track. So it's not like you do arbitration or you do, I don't know, commercial law. Um, the way our curriculum is set up is we, we don't kind of award specific specialization degrees. Rather, students can pick different areas, kind of whatever courses that they think best fit either their you know, academic interests, their career goals. You can pick the courses to tailor the curriculum to fit those interests. In terms of kind of the areas though that, that the school itself uh, maybe specializes in or prioritizes, um, it's areas like uh, international law, comparative law, uh, business law, international commercial law. Um, although you will find broader courses than that. Oh, another big one I, I kind of missed. Um, obviously kind of like Asian, Chinese law um, and, and intellectual property law. Um, if, if you are thinking that what you really want to do is something like human rights law, uh, I'm going to be very blunt and just say you probably uh, are not going to find your best fit going and studying anywhere in China. Um, you know, probably you should look to somewhere like 
you know, light in university or, you know, going to France. Um, but if your interest is sort of any of the areas of international law, commercial law, um, we would have, you know, lots of courses that would interest you in those areas, as well as some courses in, you know, public interest, maybe labor law, kind of other specialty topics as well. A uh, question about application. So Ilaria said that she's interested in applying, but she's been thinking about the 2022-2023 academic year. So in this case, would you advise her to wait or you advise her to put an application through at the moment and she can still be considered for the next year? Um, if so, uh, this was from Ilaria, right? Yeah. Um, if, if you have the documents already that you would need. And the main thing would be if you've already graduated or if you would be graduating this spring, meaning you would be qualified to apply already this year. Um, you can certainly go ahead and apply this year, even if you're looking at 2022. What would happen sort of the benefit of doing that is if you are admitted this year, but aren't actually planning on coming in 2021, you can defer your admission for up to a year. Um, and, and that's often ends up being a, a good opportunity for many students because you've already locked in that you know you're admitted to the program, but then you can maybe take a year to, uh, maybe you're doing an internship currently in your home country. Maybe you need to finish up some bar requirements, or maybe you just need extra time to look for scholarships to help fund the program before you travel to China. Um, so there's no, you know, there, there's not really any downside to going ahead and applying this year. Um, and if you want more details on that, I would say contact me directly and I can send you a, a lot of information about kind of your options with applying this year versus next year. Thank you, Cole. You actually mentioned scholarship. We received a couple of questions about scholarships. I know Nicholas mentioned during his speech, maybe you can give us a bit more of information about scholarships opportunity. Yeah, scholarships are understandably um, one of the most, I think, important questions that should be on any student's mind. Um, and and I think it, you know, wherever you go in the world, obviously funding for something like an LLM is, is a top priority. Um, the, so the first thing I'll say is the majority of our admitted students do get uh, some scholarship funding to bring down the costs of their program. In addition to that, studying in China is, is definitely still uh, quite a bit cheaper than studying somewhere like the UK or the United States. To go into a little bit more detail in that, um, the probably the two main types of scholarships that our students get are uh, scholarships um, from the Chinese government, um, often called CGS scholarships for short, and scholarships uh, directly from the law school. And actually, I think all three of our current alumni uh, um, were Chinese government scholarship recipients. It's, it can be a really fantastic scholarship. It covers uh, both a portion, about one third of your tuition, but really importantly on top of that, it also covers um, most or, or even all of your uh, dormitory fees, it covers your health insurance. It pays you a monthly living stipend, um, which is pretty generous. Um, the downside of the Chinese government scholarship is that the application process can, can be kind of complex and frustrating. The degree to which it is complex and the degree to which it is frustrating depends a lot on what country you're applying from, but it's, um, it's, it's almost never a, a smooth process, just to be completely blunt about it. I think it's worth it for the students that get it, um, but you need to be prepared to really uh, kind of have some, some grit and patience and stick to if you're planning on going for a Chinese government scholarship. 
The, the complete flip side are the scholarships from the law school. Um, they require no additional application. Um, we look at applicants for scholarships based on the exact same materials that you've already submitted just to apply to our program. Um, so it's, it's completely painless uh, to apply for the, the kind of in-house scholarships, the law school scholarships. The downside of them is they will only cover a portion of your tuition. They won't cover things like dormitory fees or living expenses. So the best is if you can get both. Um, and in fact, I think also all three of our alumni uh, on, uh, on this webinar actually received both Chinese government scholarships and some funding from the law school itself. Um, so you can really end up with a, a very generous funding package, um, particularly if, if, you're no, uh, if you're a top applicant to the program. Thank you, Cole. Um, another question they ask us about how the classes will be. So will it be like uh, due to the current situation, like the instant learning, or will it be like face-to-face? Uh, uh, -face? Do you actually offer some online courses, for example? Yeah, so we currently uh, have both uh, in-person and online courses. Um, that is because of the pandemic. We, we are not normally an online program, um, but of course, you know, since 2020 with the pandemic, um, we've had both. So the reality right now in China is that actually the pandemic is, is very well under control. It's, it's probably one of the best countries in the world um, in terms of handling the pandemic. The, the problem is that the way that China has been able to keep uh, kind of that, that level of low cases is that it's had extremely strict uh, responses and like safety measures in response to the pandemic. So a big part of why we have online classes is, is not because our campus is closed. In fact, our campus is open and we have students and professors on campus. The problem is uh, many of our international um, professors and nearly all our international students were not able to make it to China this past year. Um, so we've been offering both and we will probably continue to offer both in-person and online courses until travel opens up more generally to China. Perfect, thank you. We actually answered all the questions that we, we had. So I wanted to ask Cole, uh, Julia, Nicolas and Marius for their time. And maybe just before um, closing the webinar, if you do have like one final piece of advice you feel like giving to every um, listening to us today. Sure, yeah. Um, I, I mean, I'm gonna, have, I'm gonna have two different pieces of closing advice. One, one more specific and practical and one kind of some broader career advice. The specific practical one is a, is a restatement of what I've already said, which is if you're even considering that you might want to apply this year, you know, with, with just a, a quick click of a button, you can very easily get in contact uh, with me, with, with one of my colleagues, um, and we are there to help you. You have plenty of time to still apply before the deadline. My second broader, maybe closing comment um, which, which to some degree echoes something that Nicholas said, is that the kind of the, the draw of China is, is so big right now. I mean, there's, there's almost no part of the world that is not being affected by the reality of China's growth today. Um, and, and whether you actually plan on working in China or working in a, a commercial or business or international law field back in your home country, or if you're just looking for adventure, it's, it's a really fascinating place to study. It's a really valuable place to build experience. And it's, it's just a really interesting place to see on the ground with your own eyes firsthand. Um, so I really encourage all of you uh, whether it's our program or just visiting China for, for your own purposes, um, you know, if you can, definitely try to do it.
Thank you, Cole. I don't know if maybe uh, our alumni would like to share some advice from your from their perspective. Hi, Marius. Hi. Well, just just maybe a, a goodbye statement from my side. Not really advice. I just I, I wish everybody who engages in this application process uh, much luck especially regarding the scholarship uh, you really need some stamina uh, the bureaucracy behind it is is incredible uh, i think they have like different national committees who are also responsible to kind of allocate the, the scholarships in different countries but even the people working in these national committees often do not really know uh, what's happening in beijing and when they will receive information so that is a bit of an issue but in our case uh, in the end it, it worked out even though i think we we were informed about the scholarship about a month before we left for China. So until almost the very end, we were not sure if it was going to happen or not. But but in the end, it worked out. And um, for any other questions, if if someone wants to have some more personal information from from me or I guess also from the other alumni, just uh, get in touch on, on LinkedIn or any other channel you will find, and uh, we'll all be happy to to answer you any other questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marius. Nicholas. <laughs> Yeah, um, this may come in handy for anyone applying for the Chinese uh, for the Chinese government scholarship. It's it's very very important and it gives you an advantage if you apply for the scholarship when you already have an admission. It, it gives you an edge. Some do apply without admission, but when you apply with an admission, it's you're within people who are given priority. So if anyone thinks about applying for the Chinese scholarship, get your admission first and then apply. It'll give you an age. Yeah, all the best. Thank you, Nicholas. I would uh, also from my side, um, all the best for the application. Uh, and I hope that you, if you go there, will have uh, a great time. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for your time. I'd like to thank all the audience for being connected and uh, for you know, listening to our webinar. As we said, we will be following up with an email, so you will have course details. So please do email and you'll be able to answer all of the questions that you might have that maybe we didn't have time to answer during the webinar. So thank you so much to everyone for their time. And we look forward to seeing you soon at the next live webinar. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of the day. Bye. Thank you all. Have a good rest of your day.